Okay, we just a uh, quick welcome to all of those uh, who are watching us on Level 5 and those who are tuning in uh, on our Facebook, uh, YouTube live stream, okay, especially our brothers and sisters from the Cambodia Church. Okay, today is the final message of our series and I spent the past two weeks talking about the pressure to perform and the causes of financial pressure and stress. And we've seen from the Bible how God gives us the true relief that we seek in those areas. If you have missed any of those messages, I just want to encourage you to catch up on them at our YouTube channel, Brighton Community Church. Okay, today I will be talking about the pressure and stress of child raising. And of the three messages, okay, this is one that I'm most excited to talk about because as a parent of two very young children, one four years old and one four months old, okay, this actually takes up a very big part of my mental, emotional, financial and spiritual life. Right? Uh, and as I w- saw this topic, I was excited because I would love to find out more about what causes the stress and pressure in child raising and what is God's relief in the Bible that I can share with all of you. Now, One problem with preaching on such a niche topic is that there's a very high possibility that many people will tune out and say, "Uh, this topic doesn't apply to me. In fact, when the doors opened this morning for the early morning service, there were nobody in the crowd. And I thought that my worst fears have come true when I look over and say, I'm really, it's all myself. I'll probably just preach to myself. Okay, but thank God it filled up after worship. Okay, so that is the morning service is a fear, worry. I know for second service, this is not a problem. Why? Because you're all excited to hear about child raising. Our struggle as parents is two things. Firstly, we are concerned about which zone we sit in so that we can be the first one to leave the auditorium, right? I think I don't know because I also know. <laughs> the second thing we're concerned about is Our children want to sit with their friends in the same box in Sunday school. So they tell us, wait, 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 mommy, daddy, I want to wait for my friend so that we can go together. And that's why we come in late, right? But thank God you are all here. Turn to somebody and say, thank God you are here. (laughs) Now, I want to let you know, okay, that today, uh, what I'm going to share can be applied to other areas in our lives. And in fact, I sincerely believe that God has a message for everyone here. Okay, regardless of whether you are currently raising a child or not, or expecting a child. Okay, so I urge you to pay attention to not just my voice, but to what the Holy Spirit might be saying to you today. Okay, the second problem. Okay, the second problem is that preaching a sermon on parenting without having actually put a kid out there into the world feels a bit like um, teaching people how to plant the best yielding durian tree. But you've never actually planted one before. Okay? And the worst, and to make matters worse, I'm the kind of person that whatever green thing I touch, dies. Okay? When I was in primary school, my teacher gave us some green beans. Have you done that experience before? Uh, experiment before? You put the green beans and you're supposed to let it grow, right? All my green beans died. Okay? And I thought that the lesson was nothing survives. Okay? But my friends, all, all my classmates, all their green beans grew very well. Right? And... Uh, just a little confession. A few years ago, uh, in the office, we have some of our staff, they are really into growing things. Right? They like to grow these like uh, cactus, la, succulents, and uh, air plants. Don't know what, la, all right? but they are, okay, they are beautiful, so they put them at the windowsill. And from time to time, I will, when I take a break, I'll go and look at it. I was like, wow, so nice, these plants, so, uh, so beautiful, so cute, helps you to relax. Um, so one day, when I was doing that, I thought, hey, let me help you water the plants. So I took the water, Wow, and they have this tiny little golden watering can, very cute looking. So I took the watering can, oh, wow, so cute. Then I water the plants. A few days later, somebody said, wow, oh, my plants die. So I didn't confess that that was me. <laughs> so today is my uh, confession. Uh, you know, and, I, and I'm not surprised, okay, because why? There's some of you might be thinking this. Huh, what do you know about parenting? You haven't even finished one yet. In fact, the salt my children eat is more than the rice your children eat. Right? I, un- I, 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 I understand your sentiment, but thank God, today's message is not based on my expertise or my experience. It is based on the authority of God's Word. Amen? And the Holy Spirit speaking to us. So, let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for today we are, as we gather in such a manner to, to look into your Word and to find out what are the causes of stress in child raising and the relief that you give to us. And I pray, Lord, that today you will speak to us personally a message that you have for us in season so that we can truly find your answer to all this. 
Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, today we're going to look at a story in the Old Testament. It's a famous story between a father and a son. If you had guessed it, it is between Abraham and Isaac. All right, let's look at a story from Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 to 14. It says this, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the wood and the, the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on that boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And from this story, I want to share with you three sources of where the stress of child raising comes from. Firstly, the stress of child raising comes from ineffectiveness. Okay, ineffectiveness. Now, we all know parenting is a full-time job, right? But for many parents, we have many other things to do besides parenting. Okay? In Singapore, especially many couples, we hold full-time jobs, right? Both of us are at, are at work, and I, and I believe that last year during circuit breaker, it was a nightmare, right? When you have to work from home, and the children have to learn from home, and it was just chaos all over at home. And to make and you know what? It is even more challenging for single parents. You see, a large part of parenting has to deal with managing your day's schedule, right? And it involves very logistical matters you know, that uh, involve your children, such as getting them to eat their meals, finish their meal properly and promptly, getting them cleaned and ready uh, to go to school or after school, getting them to do their homework, pack up after themselves, and the worst thing, getting them ready for bed. Right? These are the basic things that once you get them all out of the way, everything else becomes easier. And parents who are effective in getting their children to accomplish this task with minimal resistance feel less stress. Right? They feel less frustrated. And this comes down to getting our children to obey our authority without questioning or complaining. Now, when you look at the story of Abraham and Isaac, what you will notice is the remarkable obedience that Abraham commands from Isaac. Even when he asked Isaac, go and lie down on the uncomfortable sacrificial altar built on wood and sticks. And Isaac knows it is, an, it is a sacrificial altar, right? He did it without question or rebellion. When I think about Isaac, I'm like, wow, he's the perfect child that any parent can dream of. I wish that my son, my four-year-old, can be half as obedient when I ask him to go and lie down on the comfortable bed in the air-conditioned room to go and sleep and add on to that, right? To get him to finish his meal without running around the house, without having to check on him, nag at him, without uh, get him to brush his teeth, bathe, change, without him lying on the floor or lying in the bathroom floor in, in protest, or to get him to pack up his toys after he has finished playing them. If only... I can get him to obey all this without having to change the tone of my voice, raise my volume, or repeat myself. I will be less frustrated and less stressed. Now, if you're a parent and you can identify with my struggles, say amen. All right. 
Right, so what's the solution? The solution from the Bible is to establish our authority as parents and to discipline them. King okay? Proverbs says this in Proverbs chapter 13. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Now, I know in today's modern culture, some find physical punishment to be deeply troubling. Okay? And some even call this poisonous pedagogy. Okay, and that's understandable, given the misuse and the abuse that we hear about from time to time. Okay, but the biblical wisdom here is that its appropriate use is effective in helping a child learn obedience and submission to parental authority. Why? Because young children cannot respond to reason. Now, when they are old, and if you have older children, you should aim to reason with them, give them a meaningful reason why they should obey and why they should do certain things. But if they are just a child... Reasoning alone doesn't work. You see, because of sin, we are all born with a bent, right? We are all born with a bent. We are not blank slates. Okay, we all are born with a rebellious heart. Okay, we are not blank slates just waiting for the right information and right in, uh, logic to just input into us and we'll be good people and good citizens. Right? We are born with a bent, a soul direction that is away from God and in hostility towards others, which means that as sinful fallen human beings, especially as a child, what we need more than instruction is correction. That's why Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15 says this, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Right? Folly is bound up in the heart of the child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. James Dobson says this, he's the expert in uh, child raising. Right? He says this in his book, The strong Built Child. By learning to yield to the loving authority of his parents, a child learns to submit to other forms of authority which will confront him later in his life. His teachers, school principal, police, neighbours and employers. And to achieve this, he says, that when they defiantly challenge you, win decisively. Okay? When they defiantly challenge you, win decisively. Talk to them, set up boundaries and then enforce the rules firmly and fairly. Now, the two, even though I've only been parenting for the past four years, two crucial things that I aim to establish with my children in my parenting is this. Firstly, to let them know I love you. Right? Secondly, I'm boss. Okay? I love you, I'm boss. Say that to somebody next to you. I love you, I'm boss. <laughs> right? I, I need to let them know that daddy loves you unconditionally extravagantly and selflessly, but I'm in charge, right? I'm in charge. And this extends to us as a couple, as husband and wife, father and mother, right? And, and this, what this means is that as a couple, okay, we must be united in establishing authority, okay? Our children need to know the consequences and the certainty of the consequences, Okay, and he cannot play us against each other or manipulate either of us. When we say that at a certain time you'll be cut off, you'll be cut off. When we threaten at the count of three, you are, you are going to get punished, you will get punished. Right? They cannot run to mommy and say, ah, I don't want daddy, I run to mommy. I don't want mommy, I run to daddy. Or run to mommy and say, daddy say okay, but actually daddy didn't say, daddy didn't say anything. Worse still, daddy not even at home. <laughs> right? we, so as a couple, we must work together. Right, to, to establish the authority at home. And we must never, never, ever assassinate each other's authority. Now, you know what makes it harder? When you throw in the in-laws. Right? When you throw in the in-laws into the mix, the grandfather, grandmother, everybody throw in. Right? It makes it harder. And understandably so, because why? Grandparents inevitably want to dote and spoil their grandchildren crazy. Right? I, I struggle with this, I grapple with this, and I thought hard about this as well. And actually, I come to the realization that, you know, it's understandable that they will want to spoil them. Right? Here, all my friends also, you know, we complain about the same things. Okay? But let me say this, okay? I think we need to cut them some slack. Right? We need to be a bit more chill about this. Let them pamper our children. Let them spoil them crazy. Let them pay for everything so that you don't need to pay. That's wise, right? <laughs> Let them buy everything that they need to buy. Then you don't need to spend a single cent. <laughs> but, but, okay, we must work with them intentionally to establish the authority structure at home so that 
your in-laws, your, the grandparents don't unknowingly undermine your authority. Right? You work with them so that you can be effective. You see, ineffectiveness due to the inability to establish authority and command obedience from our children causes stress and pressure. If you want to increase your effectiveness and find relief in child raising, then you must learn to establish authority and be the ones who set the schedule, determine the, the standards at home and the boundaries within which your children can act. Right? That will help you relieve stress in this area. And if you're interested to find out how to do this, if you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're expecting to be a parent, or if you know people who are parents who can benefit from being more effective in their parenting, then let me encourage you to talk to Pastor Han Ping, okay? and go and sign up for the upcoming Alpha Parenting Workshop. Okay? That will help you be more effective okay, in your parenting. So the first cause of stress comes from ineffectiveness. The second cause of stress comes from insecurity. In the first point on ineffectiveness, we saw the obedience of Isaac to his father Abraham. In this second point on insecurity, we're going to look at the obedience of Abraham to God. You see, for Abraham to obey God, to sacrifice Isaac is no small feat. Okay, we're not even talking about the moral dilemma of having to sacrifice your child. You see, Isaac was not an ordinary son. He was a son Abraham waited 25 years for. And when he had him, he was 100 years old. Right? That's mind-blowing. Right? In this day and age, when you hear your friends say, oh, I'm, I'm going to get pregnant at 40 or 41 years old, you are already like, whoa. Imagine at 99 years old. <laughs> and on top of that, Isaac was supposed to be the fulfillment of God's promise to bless him and make him a great nation. But Abraham obeyed God without question, without rebellion. Why? Because Abraham was not insecure. He trusted that God is faithful, that he will make a way. And so he obeyed God without question. That's why he could say to Isaac, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Even though he might not know how, he might have said it with that shaking voice, he knew that God is faithful. And thousands of years later, the author of the New Testament book of Hebrews says this about Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11. He says, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God has said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. You see, our insecurities over how our children will turn out not only causes us stress, but it affects the way we make decisions in our finances, in our time management, and how we relate with them. When we feel insecure about our children's development, right, whether they will turn out to be smart or not, or whatever professions that they are, we, we try to mitigate that. And we end up burdening them with that overload of enrichment classes. Right, we spend more money than necessary to send them to branded institutions, right? like blueberry, blackberry, strawberry, whatever berries there are today. Right? And we agonize, we get anxious when we cannot get, you know, get a place for them in these uh, berries. Right? When we feel insecure about what people might think about our parenting, we get flustered by people's comments and opinions easily. We stress over what changes we need to make to parent the right way. Okay, when we are busy with work, and we all know this, right? there are, pe there are seasons in our work you know, cycles that we, we are very busy, right? that we cannot be home for our children as much. We cannot have that as a family time as much. Or we don't earn as much compared to our children's par uh, friends' parents. Okay, we, we feel guilty that we are not able to give them as much uh, as compared to others. You know, one of the things that we talk about on Friday as a cell group, uh, we talk about comparison, right? When we're discussing about last week's sermon on finances. And we're just saying that, yeah, how, you know, when our children, uh, children's classmates, parents invite us to their house to go and have a play date. You know, the stress comes from the comparison. When we go to their house and say, wow, what is this? Last, on Friday, I learned a term called GCB. You all know what's GCB or not? I only know on Friday, right, that it's a good class bungalow, meaning you waste money building the place. Right? 
And they were talking about the, the, the pressure that comes from that comparison. And I, I think it is very real. Right? When I brought my son, Zach, uh, to, when we bring our kids to my, my school, school friend, right, my schoolmate's house to play, uh, when Zach walked in and he said, Daddy, Porsche! I was like, okay, <laughs> don't ask me anything else. Porsche, very good, let's go upstairs. <laughs> right? And then to say go upstairs, that's another thing, right? Uh, we feel it, right? We feel it. We feel the insecurity uh, when, when our children, when we feel that we cannot give our children as much as, as well as other people. And what happens? We try to overcompensate, right? In those times, we try to overcompensate. We give in to whatever that they demand. Now, I point out all these things not because I have total victory, right? I struggle with all these insecurities as well. And as a young parent, I feel the same insecurities. I understand fully the temptation to respond to all these insecurities. So what's the Bible's solution? Okay, the Bible's answer is found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. It says this, Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. What is the wisdom here? The wisdom is this. There's no enrichment class that you can send them to, no school you can enroll them in that will guarantee they will never stray and they never choose the wrong path in life. Right? Just recently, the viral news of some students from a supposed elite school and the way they behave with money right, went viral. Everybody was like condemning all these people about their moral, their values and all these things. There's no guarantee when we send them to the best programs, to the best genius class, that they will never stray and that they will never choose the wrong path. And what this verse also tells us is this, our moment for shaping them will soon be over. As the old saying goes, in parenting, the days are long, but the years are short. Right? In parenting, the days are long, but the years are short. So the question we need to ask ourselves is this, do we focus so much on trying to give them things that we never had, that we forget to give them what we did have? You see, the truth is that unless they have an internal conviction of what is right and wrong, good and evil, and what life consists of and is for, they will stray away. So the best way to help our children is to help them develop the right worldview and the right values to take them through life. And for us Christian parents, it's to teach and model for our children what it means to live faithful Christian lives and to live out our faith passionately. Now, just a caveat. There's no guarantee that when you do that, your children will surely follow. But I think it will be worse if we don't. Because when we don't, then when, when our children leave church, when they reject Christianity, they are not really rejecting Christ or Christianity. They are rejecting the kind of faith that we have portrayed. Right? James Dawson also says this, there's nothing more important than parents passing on a generational legacy of faith and values to their children. See, start them off the way they should go. The way to overcome our insecurity is to recognise that God has brought them into this world according to His purpose for their lives. Right? It's to trust that God loves them more than we can possibly love them and that He will take care of them according to His good, pleasing and perfect plan for their lives. When we were preparing to go to Cambodia, for me, I'm a very simple guy. To me, it's like, I can weather all this. We've been through army. What's, what's the big deal of moving to another country? Right? Just some logistical matters. If you're sick, just pop some pills. You, know, you should be fine. So I was, for me, I was okay. And we're going through this whole mental exercise of like preparing ourselves, uh, taking, checking out the, the boxes about things that we need to get ready, people sending us contacts of like emergency contacts, medical places. But as I was doing that one day, I started to think about my son. Because every one of us knows that uh, the medical situation in Cambodia is really horrible. Right? Uh, the joke is that when you go to the hospital, you probably die rather than you come out. Right? So people self-medicate. And when, we were, and when I was thinking of that whole situation, and I thought about my son, I suddenly became very, very worried. <laughs> I became very, very insecure about what's going to happen to him. What if he falls sick? What if, what if he gets injured? You know, what, what if all these things happen? Then what am I going to do with him? Where do we go? What if he dies? And as I was agonizing over all this, one morning when I was doing my devotion, God spoke to me. He said, I love him more than you can possibly love him. Right? I care for him more than you can possibly care for him. And I will take care of him more than you can possibly provide for him. 
And that assured me that God, our Heavenly Father, loves our children more than we can ever love our children. So instead of channeling our time, energy, and resources into what our insecurities direct us, we need to put them into teaching and modeling that for them a life that's lived passionately for God. Right? To start them off in the way they should go. Teach them the right worldview and the right values. And will the Christians say amen to that? Amen. amen. Now, the first cause of stress is ineffectiveness. The second cause of stress is insecurity. The third cause of stress is idolatry. Turn to somebody and say idolatry. Now, in his book, Counterfeit Gods, Timothy Keller expounds on this story of Abraham and Isaac. And he revealed why God had to put Abraham through this seemingly cruel test. Don't you find it very cruel? Right? After all these years, and you say, hey, go and sacrifice him. Right? Keller says this, Previously, Abraham's meaning in life had been dependent on God's word. Now, it was becoming dependent on Isaac's love and well-being. The center of Abraham's life was shifting. God was not saying you cannot love your son, but that you must not turn a loved one into a counterfeit God. A counterfeit God or an idol is anything that has come to be the ultimate thing in our life. That thing or that person is what your identity, your sense of worth and significance is tied up with. It can be your work performance, like what we talked about in the first week, or your finances, like we talked about last week. And it can also very well be our children. Now, how do we know? How do we know that your children has become your idol? Okay, let me give you uh, four quick markers. Five, lah, okay, I'll throw in a bonus later. Okay? Four quick markers first. For you to assess for yourself whether your children has become an idol in your life. Okay? Firstly, you cannot bear to discipline or displease your child. Okay? You cannot bear to dis discipline or displease your child. Second, you need to influence or control most things that affect your child. Okay? You over-parent. Third, Whatever affects your child, affects you. Whatever affects your child, controls you. And fourth, your desire to protect your child, to control your child, is stronger than your desire to see him grow to be the, the man that God has called him to be. Whatever that might be. Right? Assess yourself on these four markers. And I'll just throw in the last one for the Christians, okay? If, when you have a child, you realise your devotional life has become lesser, you become less regular in church, you, or you stop serving altogether, right? then maybe that's an indicator to you that your child has crept up the ladder to become the idol that counterfeit God in your life. You see, when our sense of significance and identity are tied to our parenting outcomes, then we have made our children our idols. We are using them to prop up our worth, to prop up our value, to prop up our sense of identity rather than truly loving them. We need them to perform. We need them to behave well so that we look good, so that we feel good about ourselves. And the stress and the pressure we put on them so that they will behave well, perform well, is immense. Right? It messes up the child's mind. It messes up the child's life. Keller puts it this way, if anyone puts a child in the place of the one true God, it creates an idolatrous love that will smother the child and strangle the relationship. Right? It will smother the child and strangle the relationship. So if we want to find relief, if we want our children to grow better, and we want our relationship with our children to become better, we need to release this idol. We need to recognize that we don't own them. We don't possess them. We have been entrusted with them to raise them to be independent, unique individuals. And ultimately, they are beyond our control. They are free agents. They have to make their own decisions at the end of the day. And they will. So the way to release this idol, how? It is to know that God loves us. Turn to somebody and say, God loves you. And how do we know that? by looking to the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, at the end of the story, Abraham proved that Isaac wasn't his idol, right? He truly worshipped God. And just as he was about to plunge the knife into Isaac's chest on that hill, God stopped him and he said, Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son. But you know what? Thousands of years later, on that very same hill, God 
did not withhold his son, his only son. When Jesus Christ hung on the cross and took upon himself all the sins of the world, past, present and future, God the Father turned his face away from him. On that fateful day, God did not stay his hand. Right? God did not stay his hand. And let's read this passage that I quoted in the first sermon, Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? To our pressure in life, to our stress, our difficulties, anxieties, our problems, our, our, the people who oppose us. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? When we understand, when we internalize, when we are convicted of how much God loves us because of the cross of Jesus Christ, how much God is for us, He is with us, He is there to provide for us, then we will no longer depend on our children, on the outcome of our parenting to make us feel significant, to make us feel good about ourselves. Our worth will no longer be tied up with our parenting outcome, but the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Our identities will not be tied up with our children's development, but our status as children of God. When we understand this, that is how we are able to release this idol and not be stressed up and pressurized by it. Amen? Now, may I just invite the worship team to join me? You know, um, I was very excited, like I said at the start. Okay, I was very excited to preach this message. But to be honest, when I was preparing for it, I think I had, I had the most sleepless nights over this. Why? Because it weighs heavily on my heart. Because I know this. This is one area of my life where there's no certain outcome for my efforts. Right? I can do everything that I can do. Right? I can give my children the best that I can give. But I cannot be very sure that they will turn out well. Right? That they will turn out right. That they will never stray. I can only fully depend on God and trust that He knows best. That He wants the best for my children more than I do. And just as a sinner, I am a sinner, saved by grace. I need a new heart. I need the guidance of the Holy Spirit in my life. So do my children. Right? So do your children. And I was reflecting on this over the course of my short four years of parenting. Okay? Like I said, your children eat salt more than my children eat rice. I've learned to see myself as being entrusted with this awesome responsibility to start my children off the way they should go by leading them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, by teaching them, modeling for them what it means to love God and to love people generously and what it means to live a life that is faithful and a life that is passionate for God. You know, I'm still far from being perfect right, as the perfect parent, but I know that I'm being perfected by my Heavenly Father who definitely parents me perfectly. Amen? Now, may I just invite all of you to stand as we close. Today, I want to encourage you. Okay, I want to encourage you to reflect on the state of your heart. Are there any idols that have taken up residence in your heart and taken up the place of God in your life? They could be children. They could be your desire to have children. Or there could be things like your family, your career, your achievements, a romantic relationship, your physical beauty, money, a political cause or social cause that you're passionate about, your moral track record, your ministry success, or even your popularity. What are these idols that have caused you to act irrationally or irresponsibly even? Today, I want to encourage you to come back to God, come back to His love and to repent of your idols, to turn back to Him for that sense of validation and significance that we truly, that we deeply need, that we truly seek. Turn back to your Heavenly Father who loves you, who graciously gives you all things, to trust in that because He has not withheld even His Son from you. And like what I said, at the very beginning of this whole series, remember, you are deeply loved, highly favoured,
and greatly treasured. That's who you are. You are a child of God. That is what gives you that freedom to say that I don't need my children, their outcomes to prop me up. Their F on the report card doesn't mean I'm a failure as a parent. Right? The opinions of other parents about why your son is screaming and you're trying very hard to tame him, it does not determine your worth as a person. We find that in Jesus Christ, in our Heavenly Father who loves us. Amen? So I want to invite you, encourage you to turn back to God today. Reflect on that. If there are any idols in your hearts, to repent of them. And I want to especially address my fellow parents. Right? Humbly, I say this to you. The most important thing you can do for your children is to help them establish the right worldview and the right values that will take them through life. And if you're a Christian, that is to lead them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. To so model for them what it means to love God, what it means to love people, and what it means to live a life that's passionate for God. That is the most important thing you can do for your child. And today, if in any way or for whatever reason you have lost sight of the cross, if you have lost sight of your passion for God, you know that before your children came along, you were passionate for God. I want to encourage you to come back to God, your Heavenly Father. Ask Him to affirm in your heart once again of His love for you. Ask Him, ask the Holy Spirit to renew your love for Him once again, to rekindle the passion for His name so that you can be a good model for your children at home not just for your sake, but for the sake of your children's future. Because you are the window through which your children will see God, will experience God, and will understand God. You, not the Sunday school, you are the most important discipler for your children. And finally, to to our friends who are non-Christians, as I say every single week, the truth is this you will never experience a breakthrough in your parenting if you're a parent in your life if you do not give up on the idols that have bound you up. If your children have become your idol, you will never experience the freedom to parent with a genuine love because you need them to perform, to behave so that you will feel good about yourselves. The only way to be set free from all these idols is to turn to Christ, turn to God, as your source of validation and significance and say, Jesus, I want you to be my source and I want to be set free from having to hold on to my children and to depend on them to make myself feel better. Right? And if that's you today, I want to invite you, give you a, give you a chance to, to say, I, I invite you, Jesus, into my life. And all you have to do is to just pray this simple prayer after me. Alright, let's pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, Thank you for your love. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your Son, that you did not withhold him from us. But out of your love, you allowed him to die on the cross for my sins. Today, I repent. I turn away from the idols in my life. I turn away from my child, my children as the idols of my life. And I turn back to you for my worth, my validation, my purpose, my significance. I invite you, Lord Jesus, into my life today. And I ask that, Lord, you come and show me, reveal to me more of the Father's love that I may be set free from the other loves of this life to truly love my children, to truly parent them with a genuine desire to see them grow up in the way that God has designed and purposed for them in their life. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you have said that prayer, or if you want to say that prayer, you never said just now, I want to encourage you. Talk to your friend who has invited you this afternoon. Right? Talk to them and share with them and they will help you get started in this journey of discovering the Father's love for you.